welcome all of you, and we are so glad you are joining us. Pastor Mingo is still in Israel. I hope you've had uh, an opportunity to see some of her Facebook posts. She's having a marvelous time, and it really was a special time for her to be there. And um, she will return this week and be in the pulpit next week. So uh, we pray for her safe return. We welcome our speaker today uh, as he presents something special for us. Reverend Christ is a retired district superintendent from the Indian Conference. Today's reenactment of John Wesley by Reverend Christ presents a splendid opportunity to have an all-Wesleyan service. Between John Wesley, his brother, Charles Wesley, and his nephew, Samuel <coughs> Sebastian Wesley, Charles's son, there appears approximately 60 hymns in the current United Methodist hymnal, of which either text, music, or both were composed by these gentlemen. Some of the more familiar selections will be sung and heard throughout today's service. The daily um, Latin devotionals are still available either to download from online or there are some paper copies out there if you want to do that. Today is the Dr. Paul Bender Memorial Series of the Clockwalk. Dr. Bender was our associate pastor years ago, and <coughs> this is, he was very concerned with hunger problems, and so they have dedicated this walk to, the, to him. We have a team of walkers that are going to participate and help end hunger locally and worldwide. So if you would like to... Uh, support one of the walkers. Uh, I know Pam Pierce and several different others are walking, so if you want to support them with a donation, you can see them after the trip. Um, AARP safe driving classes were scheduled twice this month, but they have been canceled. Uh, Lee is right here with us. So you can see him afterwards if you need more information on that. We are very sad to announce that Jerry Clinton and Marshall, our eldest member at 104 years of age, died peacefully in her sleep at home last Wednesday. Her family plans to have a memorial service here at Trinity sometime after Easter. We will let you know. Please see the other announcements that are in your handout or that were on the list before the service. If there's no more announcements, I invite you to stand for our invitation. Join me together. Gracious God, make us the witness of your great spirit here in this place. Touch and heal our brokenness and lift us out of despair and doubt. Dry our tears of pain and sorrow comfort and nourish us with the many blessings of your great love, O oh God. May we flourish and blossom in the warmth and compassion of your healing, love, and grace. Amen. The Wesleyan brothers, both Charles and John Wesley, were very well known to make music and a crucial part of their ministry. And they encouraged their congregations to sing out loud and bless them. In fact, they were so much in peace. How singing that the Lutherans became jealous of Methodists. So let's see if that can happen today. I'll start you out. And you take it from this four sentence of oh, four thousand times to sing. One of the best known Wesleyan hymns in the world. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glory of my God in me, each triumph of His grace. 
to the Father. Prayer is an important part of Lent as it is the main source of communication to God. Lent offers us all a very special opportunity to grow in our relationship with God and to deepen our commitment to this way of life. In our busy world, Lent provides us with an opportunity to pray more deeply as we meditate on the sacrifice of Jesus. So let to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this season of Lent. Help us to draw into deeper communication with you throughout these 40 days. Lord, we come to you today with lots on our minds. We all have things going on in our lives that you would help, free, pain, and numerous other challenges. However, we know we are not alone in what we are facing. You are there with us always. Help us to have an attitude of gratitude, remembering our blessings in the midst of our struggles. But we do know that our hearts are breaking for Ukraine. In this challenging situation, we are comforted knowing that people worldwide are gathering and offering prayers for Ukraine. 
the most powerful way we can help is to come to you in prayer for not only our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, but all who are affected with this situation. Give us patience as we wait for good to triumph. Hear our voices as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. While we prepare to join the scene in another Western world, I'd like to take just a few moments to share how I speak the extraordinary life of the new school. Which is by the right of hand for the call of God of the Savior. And it's explained how after he's in the research of the Lord. This is not welcome by the Savior, or is it included sometime in the Bible? But that is his moment, the youth who had a glad investment in the Savior's church. The church continued to keep him in the Savior throughout his life. As a result of that, because of his anti-slavery movement, the generation of that performance that results in the Civil War. My great grandfather, Julius Butler, was able to escape from a Louisiana plantation on the first of the day and join one of the few colored residents allowed by the president of the country to be for great numbers. They helped turn the tide of the Civil War, thereby gaining at least partial freedom for him and his descendants, including me. Thank you, John Wesley, for Serving of God. Now let's turn our attention to the M332 Spirit of Faith come down. The Lord is Spirit of faith come down, we hear the things of God, and make to us the God that know and witness through the blood, to die the blood of life, and give us eyes to see. Who did for every sinner that has truly died for me? No Saving power and heart, 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to be among the people called Methodists this day. As we have gathered to worship, I want to thank our good music leader. Thank you, sir, for inspiring. You so inspired me that I may, well, you know, God does set me on fire. And people come to watch me burn. I pray that your soul may be touched by God's love and grace today. Amen. Amen. Mr. Wesley, and I am not the uh, good Reverend Stephen can confirm this that my question is to preach for two hours. Who says? The length of my sermon will be determined by your response. Amen? And if you are rather lackadaisical with it, it's a good British word. If you are rather lackadaisical with it, I may preach the whole two hours. Amen? So you understand me as I understand you. It is a privilege. I always begin every sermon which I preach by praying this prayer of Sir Richard of Chichester. Try to say that quickly five times. But I always pray this prayer, and I invite you to join with me now as we pray. Teach me, my God and King, in all things be to see. And what I do in anything, to do it as for Thee. For Thee, O Lord, for Thee. So may we hear with joy what You say to us today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, the scripture reading for this morning is a most familiar passage for many of you from the Apostle Paul. You know that Paul wrote at least two thirds of the New Testament, but I believe the most powerful of his writings, I would call it Paul's Gospel, is the book of Romans, because then he explains precisely how we come to faith, how we are to live faith. And then how we are to work in God's grace. You so see, from the first chapter of the book of Romans, I shall read the first 11 verses. Hear now God's word for you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom we have obtained access to this grace from which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings. Seems an odd statement, doesn't it? We boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
Indeed, we are not only anyone that for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves His love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, for you, for me. Much more clearly, then, now that we have been justified by His blood, we will be saved through Him from the wrath of God. For if we are sinners, we are reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more surely, now that we are reconciled, we will be saved by His life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. But I come to say, I'm going to help and grace with you this morning. You see, that's what we're making of our name for grace. God's unmerited, undeserved favor. God's unmerited, if you don't believe it, ask your spouse. They will tell you the truth. You are at times unmerited. You don't want to admit it, I don't want to admit it, but to so. But God's love is so great that He looks beyond our sin, our selfishness, as one theologian said, our anxious self-centeredness. And God claims us as His own. God loves me even though I am unworthy of His love. God forgives me even though I do not deserve it. That, you see, is precisely what grace is. You can't earn it. You're not good enough to deserve it. It is God's free gift. God's gift, and you know how, I know how you Americans are. You don't want a gift. You want to say, by God, I earned it. But you cannot earn grace, no matter how hard you try, no matter how good you think you are, is God's gift. When you give a little child something, you teach them early on to say, what, thank you, yes. And so that's really all we can do for God's grace. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive me. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me this day of life. Thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven my sin. Thank you, Lord, that I have the privilege of living this beautiful day as your servant, as your child, as your obedient follower. That's how grace is God's unmerited, undeserved favor. And that's what we must have to do on. We're big on grace. Now, somebody asked me between the services, how, how do we get our name Methodist? Well, I must tell you a story. I was some years older than a young lad. I was uh, in in my early 30s, and I was at Oxford University. My brother Charles, the younger, Charles the younger, that's what I call him, you see, he's three years my junior. Why is it that God always speaks to my younger brother before me? He was converted to the man three years before me. He who was the majestic handwriter of poetry just pleases out of him. I'm so jealous of it, I must confess. I'm confessing my sin now, you see. But when I was after preaching, our father had become ill, and I'd gone back to the little village uh, called Upworth, some 120 kilometers northwest of London, where we hail from. Father had been ill, and I had gone back to be the pastor where he was. You see, I'm the son of an Anglican priest and the grandson of two Anglican priests. And especially I'm talking to those men in the room now. 
The last thing I wanted to become was, you guessed it, an Anglican priest. But God had God's way with one John Wesley. And here's how all of that was occurring. You see, I was back at Oxford where I was privileged to be a, a teacher. And my brother Charles and another rather famous American Christian, George Whitfield, who was much of the revival movement in your country in the 1750s and on, we joined together every morning for what we called ourselves the Holy Club. It was not a, a party name. We did not mean it that way. We meant it authentically to live a holy life. H O L Y, not W H O L L Y, but I guess it was that too. But our desire was to live as holy a life as we could. We gathered in a pub because you see that's where we Brits uh, eat and meet. So there was this little pub at Oxford. And they had a second story room, and we would go up the stairs and meet. There was a round table. There would be seven or eight of us. And then one morning, at 5 a.m. sharp, I'm not going to ask you how many of you are up at 5 a.m., but every morning, 5 a.m. sharp, we would meet. We would read the Holy Scripture for that day. We would pray, asking God's mercy. And then we did what you Americans might think is a rather peculiar thing, but we would confess our sins in the presence of our brothers. I, I won't say sisters because it was all brothers at that point. We would confess our sins to our brothers, and then one of us would speak God's word of forgiveness to that brother and say, Charles, John, whoever, Thomas, whoever you are, in the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. Those powerful words the Reverend Stephen will draw us to as we will receive Holy Communion today. You are forgiven. And so then we would pray and reflect, and then we would make our plan for the day. Oh, and over at the same time, we Methodists would be eating, you know, because we that is holy for us, Methodists, to eat. As one preacher told me, we meet to eat, eat to meet, meet to will beat. Well, that's what we do. And so every morning, 5 a.m. start, do all those things, have our breakfast. Then at 6 a.m. start, we would leave that place. Did you know that we Methodists were the first to visit in prisons? Did you know that we Methodists were the first to visit in hospitals? Did you know that we Methodists were the first to start credit unions? It was all to do God's good in the world. Well, back to my story about being up in that upper room where that holy club was. And so we would come down at 5 a.m. and then we would leave at 6 a.m. start to go and do all that ministry. And we would come down every morning, 6 a.m. start, and there was a group of older I suppose I can call them gentlemen. I'm not sure that they were, but they were right in the front of we young Oxford dogs, and they called us Bible Mars and the Holy Club and those Methodists because we were so methodical. The only thing is a claim of the reason. But we took it as a badge of honor that we should be so methodical in praying, in reading the Holy Scriptures, in joining together with the brothers and sisters, in praying, and then leaving to go and do good in the world. That's what we Methodists are about, to do all the good we can. We Methodists live by three simple rules. To do no harm, that's one writer called it a simple rule. I rather think it is most difficult not to do harm in the world. Sometimes we do harm when we mean to do well or do good, but we still do harm. I invite you to think about words you've said to your spouse or to your children. You may have meant it very lovingly, and they felt it like a knife in them. 
See, sometimes it is not so easy to not do harm, but that's what we ought to do as Methodists, to do no harm, and then to do good. You see, that's what this world needs. That's what will, what will draw others to God's love and grace as they see love enacted, good in courage in the world. That's why we Methodists feed so many people. That's why we visit and pray with the sick. That's why we give hope to those who are hopeless. That's why we care about those. Now, in my day, there were not medical physicians, doctors, as you, I am told, know about them. And so one of the passions in my life was, was to learn about how we could be better, how we could be more healthy, I don't say this to my British friends because they think I mean it thoughtfully. I mean not so. But rather, in some ways, I'm kind of ashamed of it. But in my day, the most popular book in virtually every British home was a little poem written by John Wesley called The Primitive Physic. And in it, I wrote uh, what you would call home remedies. Remedies for times, you see, if you have no physician to give you medications or to tell you what to do, which is true in my day. So my little book helped. I am not proud to say there are more copies of the primitive physics in homes than there are copies of the Holy Scripture, but it is so. We Methodists try to do good in the world. That's what you are to be about, this Trinity Church to do good, to make a difference in your community, to shine the light of God's love to those who are so broken and hurting, to be people of peace in the midst of a war-torn world, to be hopeful, not hopeless, to trust in God more and to trust in yourself Less. But the only way you can do that, dear yeah, sisters and brothers, is if you, as I say, spend time on your knees, or you may not be able to get down on your knees, but as you t- spend time in prayer, saying, God, I am no longer my own, but thine, put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. It's what we Methodists pray every year in New Year's time, the prayer of covenant, to make me decidedly, decidedly your disciple in the world. That's what we Methodists are to believe. Now, someone asked me not long ago, Mr. Wesley, what is the Methodist? To which I replied, words of Holy Scripture, Methodist is one who loves the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, as Jesus added to that Shema, the great Hebrew tradition, and your neighbor as yourself. Ah, now it gets difficult, doesn't it? When you try to love that neighbor who slams the door at 6 a.m. and awakens you, or when that neighbor refuses to speak or be kind to you in any way. It is not easy to live as a follower of Christ in a world that's all about oneself. But that is what we as God's people, as Christians, followers of Christ, are called to do. To love others knowing that God has When I was a child, I was a a very young lad. Some very angry men wanted to do harm to my family. I have not the time to tell you the story. If someone was at the first service, they might be able to tell you that story. I have not the time now. But anyway, they set our home on fire. My father being the priest there, 
And the short version is, he prayed every Sunday, O oh God, save the king and bless the king, where there were many in that congregation who did not love or care for the king. And every Sunday, my father, God save the king, God bless the king. There are some men in the town, or we're not even sure whether they were in the town or in our congregation, but some, I will call them rebel rousers. They looked at court. Our home, as many homes in our native Britain, have thatched roofs, you know, woven together from material, grass material, grass-like material, and they set it on fire. They set our home on fire. Not once, not twice, but on the third occasion, they were successful. Burned our home down. I was only six years old at the time. All my sisters and my brother Charles escaped. Samuel, my older brother, was away at school by then. And... They set it on fire. Somehow all of the other members of my family fled, but somehow in the chaos of the middle of the night, somehow little Jackie, that's what they called me, short Nick for John, Jackie was caught in his room, and the fire was lapping and falling down from the ceiling onto the, into the room in which I was. And a very brave man hoisted a smaller man upon his shoulders, and they came as close to, I'm up in the second story, and they came as close to me as they could, and the man on the shoulders of the other gentleman said, open the window, Jackie. And so with all my might as a six-year-old, I finally somehow got some miraculous strength in mine in that moment, raised that window, and then in only what I could call is the voice of God, the man said in the calm, reasoned manner, jump into my arms, Jackie. And so I jumped, and in a moment I was down on the ground, and mom and daddy were there, and all my sisters and brothers surrounding me and loving me. And if I live to be a hundred, I shall say I was a burned put from the burning. Just like the Old Testament prophet declared, a burned put from the burning. Even then I knew, oh God, what have you for my life? It was a question I hope all of you ask, no matter your age and stage at this moment. Oh God, what have you for my life? What would you have me to do with whatever remaining time I may have on this earth? How can I be your person, God? How can I share your love with a broken and hurting world? How can I be the instrument of your peace in a cacophonous world? How can I lovingly, caringly, Share the gospel with those who have not hope. You see, we who are followers of Christ, we have hope. We know to whom we belong. We know who will rescue us and redeem us in our pain, in our suffering, in our struggles, and in our adversities. We know who will redeem us. It is the Lord. So I need not have fear. Nor do you have fear, need fear. What the future holds, who holds the future? Amen? You see, and this is what I stand for. The goal of religion is not to get you into heaven. The goal of religion is to get heaven into you. Heaven into you. That's what others have said to me so many times. Oh, this is what God sets you on fire. And, and people come to watch you burn so that you might burn. That is my hope for you, dear sisters and brothers, that God's love, God's grace, God's mercy shall so envelop and consume you that you will love beyond measure, that you will serve and give and forgive, forgive, as your Lord has forgiven you. That's what we pray in the prayer. 
Forgive us this day our daily bread. We forgive those who trespass against us. So, dear brothers and sisters, that is what I want to say to you. I invite you to walk in God's holy ways. We know the ways of the world to lead to sin and destruction. We have all walked that path enough to know that when we are unfaithful, when we are not listening to what God would have us to do, that we make a lot of detours and a lot of wrong turns. It even happens to those of us as we follow Christ. We are not perfect, nor did God ever imagine that we could become perfect. But, as we must let us know, we can become perfect in love. That is the goal. We, we, we've had lots of arguments with other churches and other traditions because we talk about perfection. Now, I mean not perfect in everything you say and do, but I mean becoming perfect in love. To love and to live so thoroughly following the Lord that all your thoughts and actions are saying to yourself before you say it to others, God, what would you have me to do today? How would you have me to live today? How can I be your agent of love and grace? That's what we must do. So I say to you, my sisters and brothers, do all the good you can. By all the means you can. At all the times you can. In all the places you can, for all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Now, I think I can do that, and I try to live it. I don't live it perfectly. I am made of clay feet, as are all of you, but I do strive as the Holy Scripture says, strive to be faithful. And it is my hope that you will, in that striving, be spent. That you will live as one who loves and as one who serves. I know this is an odd thing to think about, but I'm getting to be an old man. My father's last words were these. We, he had been ill. He had, we, Charles and I were at Oxford, and we had to travel that 140 kilometers back to our little native village of Epworth. Father was on his deathbed. We rode there as quickly as we could. Not sure if father would still be alive when we arrived some days later, but fortunately he was. Mother met us at the door and said, Your father is waiting for you. We went into his room and uh, there he was lying there on his bed. And he drew us closer. He could barely speak at that point, his, his life ebbing away. But before he died, he said this to his young sons. The inward witness, son, the inward witness. Charles and I looked at each other, and it took us some moments, but then we finally began, to, the, the scales began to break from our eyes and our minds, and we suddenly understood what he was saying. It is how I live with Christ each day. The, my inward witness, how I pray, how I read, how I study, so that when I get out in the world, I can love as God has loved me. So now I'm, I'm an old man like my father was. Isn't that interesting how that happens? 
And I often think, what if I'm in my right mind, and if in that moment of my passing from this world to God's eternal kingdom, if I were able to speak some words to those who might be there listening, what would I say? I know it's strange, I'm an odd man to think such a peculiar thought. But it finally came to me, and inasmuch as I may be able to speak words at the moment of my passing, I think I would want my last words to be these. The best of all is God is with us. Best of all is God is with us. In your moments of pain, in your moments of struggle, in your moments of joy, in your times of fear, in your moments of despair, in the great moments of hope, in all things, God is with us. That's the best of all. God never leaves you, dear friend. You may be lying in a bed in a hospital bed and suffering. You may be struggling with cancer or some other disease. You may be dealing with problems with your children and your grandchildren. You may be fearful for your future and you don't have enough money or enough money. You may care. The best of all is God is with you. God will never leave you. God will always love you. Not because of who you are, but who God is. God is that God. And so, love God with your whole heart. Love Him and serve Him. Never forget, never, ever, ever forget. The best of all is God is with us. Amen. The best of all is God is with us. We are so very grateful for the witness of Mr. Wesley in our midst this morning. And I'm grateful that it is within the context of celebrating the Lord's Supper as well, which was uh, particularly significant to Mr. Wesley. Uh, he did not look at the Lord's Supper as this uh, nice little religious ceremony to just to be done among the faithful. But um, for Mr. Wesley, it was an opportunity uh, for the Holy Spirit to be active in conversing souls. And I was uh, especially grateful that. Uh, that Terry Butler chose for our communion in uh, Come Sinners to the Gospel Feast. And it reminded me that uh, Mr. Wesley did not often serve communion inside in a nice sanctuary like we are this morning because uh, he wasn't allowed to preach in Anglican services, so he was outside. And they didn't have any hymnals and they didn't have projection equipment, so they had to sing loud and lustily. Uh, they sang lustily because often Charles chose tunes that people had been singing in the pubs, but they just changed the lyrics. And it's by no accident that we celebrate uh, open communion. It does not mean that we're wishy-washy. Uh, what it means is we are convinced of the power of the Holy Spirit to convert 
the souls of men and women through the celebration of this sacrament. So, um, are we going to sing the hymn now? Can we would, would that work the same now? Very well. Number Seated, and uh, we're going to be a little bit retro here. Uh, I know we may not have used these, but uh, there's these books in front of you in the pew. We're not outside, we're in a sanctuary. Uh, so uh, you can either follow along uh, on the projection or in the, in the front of your hymnal. It's small number 12. So small number 12. So I invite you to hear this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Let, therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. And we pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And then would you join me on the next page in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, 
Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and so with your people on on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna to the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water. He took a loaf of bread and gave thanks to the Lord and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and again he gave thanks to God. And then he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out not just for the forgiveness of your sins, but for the forgiveness of the sins of the whole world. Break this in remembrance of me. This morning, in these times, if you would hold your elements, in uh, we hold these little pieces of bread and juice that is an opportunity for us to celebrate not just by ourselves personally, but that when we take these elements, these specific elements, it is an opportunity for us to celebrate with amongst each other as one people and in solidarity and peace and love and compassion with brothers and sisters in Christ around the world where Pastor Linda is celebrating communion in the Holy Land where there are brothers and sisters in Ukraine this morning celebrating the Lord's Supper. So this is a beautiful expression of unity and love. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. And together, we all feast together as a heavenly bread. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Take and drink. Lord, this morning we thank you that you not only have given, but continue to give yourself for us. Completely, extravagantly, with more generosity and more love and compassion 
that we ever can imagine. Help us to know that where the suffering is greatest, is your Holy Spirit desires to be most present. So give us the courage to go from this place as joyful, courageous witnesses embodying your love in the world. For this we give you thanks. Amen. Our final hymn is Sing Stand. Oh, I, I forgot. I almost forgot. I, I, I carried away with Mr. Wesley here. Uh, but I would be really, really remiss uh, if I did not know uh, on, on your behalf to express our great gratitude to Reverend Tide for coming and delivering such a powerful message for us this day. These are wonderful times as United Methodists to have our uh, spines stiffened as it were and to be proud of our legacy of uh, followers along with John Wesley of the living Christ in this world. So when you say you're a United Methodist, hold your head up. Uh, and Karen reminded me that as an expression of your gratitude, there are some love baskets, uh, there are some baskets in the back of the sanctuary on the way out if you would like to leave a love offering for a Reverend Kite and know that your generosity will be blessed. So, let's stand and sing together. For the final hymn, hymn number 615, for those who prefer to write a hymn note, we just want to see one of the listening hymns that was known to be a roof breath to this time. So we'll just do two stanzas. We'll sing it.